Hello, good evening. My name is Hunter, and this is content review for Principles of Biology students in Biology 212. Today we're going over plant nutrition uh, and signaling, I think. So, fun little exercise today. What do you need to consider in order to grow plants in space or anywhere else for that matter? Long range manned space travel and manned space stations may someday become a reality. Before this can occur, however, we will have to develop sustainable methods of agriculture suitable for use in space. One of the key methods being investigated is hydroponics, growing plants in water supplemented with nutrients. You are assigned to a team working on the design of a plant growth system, <laughs> on the designs of plant growth systems for use in a space station. Question one, what types of plants would you choose to grow? Explain the reasoning behind your choices. So again, for all of these, these are really open-ended. Uh, feel free to be creative here. I'm just gonna give you an example that kind of highlights some, some thought processes for answering kinds of questions like this. So all of your answers should include how much room the proposed crop plant is gonna require for growth, how much of the crop plant should uh, pr produced can be consumed uh, or otherwise used by by humans or other organisms on the space station. Uh, for example, if it makes sense to grow plants that produce a high ratio of edible to inedible matter per plant, um, on one hand, wheat plants produce fairly low ratio of edible to inedible plant matter. Um, but on the other hand, a potato a potato plant produces a much higher ratio of edible to inedible matter. Um, we have chickens on the property where I live and a dog, and we grow a lot of our own food in our garden. And so we're constantly producing plants that we eat and some of those parts we don't, the chickens will, and that's all getting recycled uh, and turned into protein for eggs and things like that. So that's a, that's a reasonable starting point. This is my little space station. <sighs> Question two, when you set up the growth system, um, let's see. What types of plants did you choose to grow? Um, getting a little ahead of myself. We're gonna need to write some of these down for y'all. So question two, we're, we're given this huge chart for considering when we set up our growth system, we need to be thinking about these other nutrients, right? Oxygen, CO2, water, um, nitrogen, potassium, calcium. Read through this list. It is good to know and be familiar with all of these, uh, be able to identify them and understand a little bit about why they're important. Um, when, as you continue in your science education, some of these are going to show up more than others. Those are the ones that you ought to pay the most attention to. Um, and these questions are really good at kind of zeroing in on what some of those might be. So what atmosphere would you need to maintain? List what components you would need to maintain in the atmosphere and why each component would be necessary. So atmosphere in the space station is obviously gonna have to emulate something similar to the atmosphere on Earth. Um, this would be a requirement for both the life of the humans uh, and for successful plant growth on the station. Plants require carbon dioxide, right? CO2 for photosynthesis and oxygen for cellular respiration. You know, the plants produce a lot of oxygen as a consequence of that. So that's getting recycled. Uh, but if the oxygen to carbon dioxide ratio becomes too high, then C3 plants in particular would undergo photorespiration instead of photosynthesis.
Hmm. If it's hard to read the text I'm typing, uh, let's see. Thank you for that real-time feedback. I can do something about it now. Let me see here. If I make it a little bit bigger, does that help? Hopefully. Hopefully that helps. I'll try to keep it consistent uh, moving forward. No problem. So if a ratio of, uh, what was it? CO2 to O2 is too high, C3 plants are gonna undergo photorespiration instead of photosynthesis. And this would reduce plant growth and crop yield. So you'd, you'd obviously have to balance the number of plants versus animals. All right. So I said plants versus animals, but this could also include uh, microbes. Microbes can be a big um, carbon dioxide producer. All right. So there's a note in here to talk about legumes. Legumes are kind of cool because they are uh, symbionts. There are symbionts associated with the plant roots. This is that mycorrhiza or that um, rhizobium that associates with their roots. And they make little nodules on the roots that are full of these mycorrhizal um, fungi, mostly. Um, fu fungi and bacteria, I think. And these are really important for fixing nitrogen and fixing nitrogen you'll remember is um, turning nitrogen in the soil into a form that the plants can then take up and turn into protein so let's write some of that out um Important rhizobia and mycorrhiza associate with roots of legumes and help to fix nitrogen. And turn it into a form plants can use to make proteins. Um, I misspoke. The mycorrhizae are fixing atmospheric nitrogen into the soil, so it's in a form that the plants can take up. All right, which of the requirements in parts A and B could be recycled? Which of them could not be recycled and explain? We already talked about oxygen and CO2, right? Um, Humans, animals, breathe in oxygen, use it for cellular respiration. The end product of that cellular respiration is CO2. That is a waste product that we are breathing out. And plants take that atmospheric CO2 and synthesize it into sugars. So that is constantly getting recycled. We then consume those sugars and turn that into energy, right? And around and around it goes. Um, water, water in the atmosphere is another one. Um, and from the urine of animals to hydrate the soil, um, all that can be recycled. Many of the minerals in the plants uh, could be recycled by composting the inedible parts. And then these can all be converted into uh, inorganic nutrients for uh, for plants by the actions of, of various microbes. Uh, microbes uh, convert inorganic 
nutrients for plants. So without these microbes, large quantities of organic waste would just build up. And as a result, most compounds other than oxygen, CO2, and water would not be recycled. So composting is a really, really important process in all of this. And the, the, the concept to underline there is the importance of microbes um, in these cycles. All right, you are interested in growing soybeans that have a higher amino acid content than those varieties that are currently available. How would you do it? So the only way to increase a given trait uh, is, to, is through selective breeding. So if we're trying to increase the amino acid yield and therefore the, the nutritional component of this vegetable um, is through selective breeding. So you take plants with the desired characteristics or you genetically modify them um, to make a variety with a higher amino acid content. And that, yeah, that's the only way to increase the base level of amino acids. You may be inclined to say things like add nitrogen to the soil, uh, nitrogen being an important co um, molecular component of amino acids, or you might want to inoculate the right, the, with, with rhizobia or, or mycorrhiza to support nitrogen fixation. Those are all important, but that doesn't change the baseline nutritional component of the fruit, right? If there's a deficit, if there's a nutritional deficit in the soil or in the atmosphere, then the plant isn't going to have be able to produce those nutritious fruits. So you still need those things, but just adding those things doesn't increase that max possible yield, right? That those ideal conditions. And I didn't type any of that down. Um, the only way to increase the nutritional component of the fruit is through a selective breeding process or genetic modification for the desired trait. Cool. All right, so questions four through five get a little funny. Uh, pine seedlings grown in sterile potting soil grow much slower than seedlings grown in soil from the area where the seeds were collected. Which of the following is a reasonable explanation and explain your answers? Explanation one, the normal symbiotic fungi are not present in the sterilized soil. Is this a reasonable explanation for the slower plant growth in the sterile environment? I think, yes, this is a reasonable explanation. Why? This is a reasonable explanation for the slowed growth because plants that have a symbiotic relationship with mycorrhiza are better able to take up the essential nutrients, essential meaning they don't produce it themselves, essential nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus specifically. So without the ability to take up large quantities of nitrogen and phosphorus, the plants would grow much more slowly. Plants that have a symbiotic relationship with mycorrhiza, if you think about the spelling, are better able to take up the essential nutrients, nitrogen, here we go, and phosphorus. So without the ability to take up those nutrients, it would grow more slowly. How about water uptake? Water uptake is faster when mycorrhizae are present. This could also be reasonable. Um, although, yeah. your text does not indicate that mycorrhizal fungi contribute to increased water uptake. 
So an important note there. Some researchers have found that mycorrhiza do increase both water and nutrient uptake. Okay. Question six, you observe the results shown in the graph below by measuring plant growth in two different soils, soil A and soil B. Again, little review of scientific literacy. Check your axes first. We have plant growth on the left in terms of grams, so a unit of mass, and we have time in weeks on the bottom. So increase in mass against time. Assuming a difference between the soils is the presence of mycorrhiza in one soil and its absence in the other, which soil has mycorrhiza and how do you know? So if we know from our previous reading that mycorrhiza support uptake of nutrients that are important for growth, it follows that the soil without mycorrhiza will show decreased growth relative to the other one. So looking at our code here, or our key rather, we have a dashed line as soil A and a solid line as soil B. They trend together for the first few weeks. And then they diverge at around week three with the dashed line showing less plant growth than the solid line. Which soil has the mycorrhiza? We're going to go with the dashed line. That would be soil A. Uh, soil, excuse me, has the mycorrhiza, soil B. Okay. Propose an explanation for why the plants in soil A and B grow at nearly the same rate for the first few weeks. One potential explanation is that seedlings have a seedlings, seedlings have a lot of nutrients stored in the endosperm of the seed. So all of the nutrients that it needs to get started are contained there. And therefore they don't need a lot of external nutrition at first. Uh, question in the chat, if it's slower then wouldn't it be soil A? So I read the question a little bit backwards and now I'm gonna reread it because it's, it's worth going back and checking. Assuming a difference between the soils is the presence of mycorrhiza in one soil and its absence in the other, which soil has mycorrhiza and how do you know? And so, so given the rationale that if it has the mycorrhiza, there will be more plant growth because it can access the nutrients better, then the line that trends up the furthest is going to be your mycorrhiza rich soil. And using our key, and this is why it's important to check the key several times, soil B appears to have more plant growth than soil A. And so soil B has the mycorrhiza and because it shows better growth over soil A. Yeah, so I, I feel pretty confident in that answer. Yeah, okay. So going back to the time, yeah, no problem. Um, some some of the, the point of these live streams is not simply to regurgitate information that you've already seen at you. It's also to kind of take that information or at least go through the problem solving process to get through these questions. Um, many times, even if you don't know the factoid, you can, deduce what the answer should be based on the, the other information contained in the question, right? Um, 
But the factoid that you need to know there is that mycorrhiza support nutrient uptake. All right. Proposed explanations for the timing. Why, why, why do they grow at the same rate for the first few weeks and then diverge? First was that seedlings have nutrients stored in the endosperm of the seed. Uh, another explanation could be that when a seed is first planted, there's ample nutrients in the soil directly surrounding the first roots that can be easily obtained by the plant. And after those nutrients are depleted, the plant gets and and the plant gets larger. Um, it needs additional nutrients, and so it has to work a little bit harder and slows down. So you, you might observe the effects of nutrient depletion if mycorrhiza um, are not present. So another explanation. Um, ample nutrition in the soil directly surrounding the first roots that can be easily obtained by the plant after the initial growth. Um, After the initial growth, soil depletion would be observed in soil without mycorrhiza. Okay. So how do gravity and light affect plant growth response? Review chapter 37 of your textbook, uh, then answer the following questions. One of the problems associated with growing plants in space is the lack of gravity. How does gravity affect the normal growth of a plant's roots, stems, and other parts? Explain the mechanisms involved. I'm gonna give you a hint. Oh. Fix my text here. The molecule of interest is auxin, A-U-X-I-N. Under the influence of gravity, auxin accumulates in the lower side of the root and stem. Higher auxin concentrations stimulate cell elongation, getting longer, excuse me, higher auxin concentrations stimulate cell elongation in the stem, but inhibit cell elongation in the root. We've got some numbers here. In the shoot region, shoot above ground, a concentration of oxygen between 10 to the negative 8 and 10 to the negative 4 molar that is moles per liter, stimulates cell elongation. And according to the acid growth hypothesis, this is another one that'll show up several times in your science education. Um, oxygen concentrations in this range stimulate proton pumps, which lower the pH, that is increase the acidity in the cell wall. And this activates enzymes that break crosslinks between cellulose molecules and allow the cell to elongate. Let's type that out. According to the acids, <laughs> according to the acid growth hypothesis, oxygen concentrations between, I remember, yep, 10 to the negative eight, 10 to the negative eight to 10, the negative four molar stimulate proton pumps, which lower the pH in the cell wall. This activates enzymes that break cross links between cellulose molecules and allow the cell 
to elongate. How would the lack of gravity affect normal plant growth? So if it's a differential accumulation of oxen, right, in different areas of the plant, we remove the mechanism for that accumulation, how would we overcome that? Normal seed germination and seedling growth begin underground in the absence of light. So under these conditions, the seedling relies entirely on this gravitropic, there's a good vo vocabulary, you. this gravitropic response of the shoot and root to orient these above ground and underground uh, respectively, so. In the absence of gravity, oxen concentrations in the root and shoot would not vary, and growth of the shoot away from gravity and growth of the root towards gravity would not occur. proposed mechanisms to overcome this problem. Plant orientation is also affected by light. Right? The response to light can help counteract some of the lack of gravity. Um, and it, in addition, if the plants are grown hydroponically, you can use something like a dense mesh to restrict growth around certain parts of the plant before I get too ahead of myself. Phototropism. So if I've got my seedling and it has shoot aspects and root aspects growing kind of in every direction, we can contain the roots where we want them to be in this hydroponic mesh, right? The mesh also creates kind of a substrate for the water to adhere to, which is also helpful in that zero gravity environment. All right, another problem with growing plants in space relates to a plant's light requirements and phototropic responses versus the photoperiod responses for the plant. So even if you've never heard these words before, you can, you can start to break down the meanings of them by looking at uh, the, the roots that make them, right? Photo means light. Tropic is a suffix meaning orientation. So phototropism, orientation with respect to light. Photoperiods is about periodicity or time cycles, right? So how do phototropism and photoperiodism differ? I wanna make sure you can see this. So another way to say this is phototropism is where growth happens in response to light and photoperiodism is when that growth happens. Hi, baby. This is my dog wanting to be let out. Excuse me.
Uh, important to note here, or just an extra factoid to help drive this home, phototropism also relates to auxin. So auxin will distribute itself differentially throughout the plant in response to how much light that part of the plant is getting. What light characteristics would you use to maximize plant growth per unit time? So why do plants need light? Photosynthesis, right? In photosynthesis, the chlorophyll molecules, chlorophyll are those pigmented molecules that absorb light. I can write this as I go. In photosynthesis, These are in uh, photosystems one and two, remember? And photosystem two is the first one in the chain, uh, in, in the pathway. You need to remember that. Um, uh, they respond to or absorb light in the red and blue wavelengths, wavelengths of the visible electromagnetic spectrum. And as a result, if nothing else is limiting, the more red and blue light available, the faster the photosynthetic, photosynthetic rate per unit time. You may notice that there is a slight violet cast to uh, the lighting in this room, and that is because there is a shelf over here with grow lights on it that are keeping my house plants alive during the winter months. And that that violet, of course, is that mixing of blue and red. It is not because the lights themselves are purple, right? All right, what kind of physical environment would you need to maintain appropriate phototropic responses among the plants? This is a very bi biology 211 focus question, which I didn't take. That's possible. Um, that's right, yes, because we were do dealing a lot with the, the, the microbiology of plants and animals. Um, I, I don't blame you for that. <laughs> um, and thank you for that reminder. I, I forget sometimes that PSU allows students to take these out of sequence, which is fine. Um, there are different emphases in the different classes, but this is a way to kind of get a, a taster of that microbio and see how it informs um, a lot of the other stuff that we'll be getting into later in this term, which I'm very excited about. Um, and I, I do like how the sequence kind of goes micro, macro systems, you know. They all inform each other. It's a complex system of systems, but I digress. Uh, physical environments, don't overthink this one. Um, plant orientation is affected by light. Where is the light oriented on planet Earth? Above the plant. So, I keep forgetting my fonts and you all are being very polite by not saying anything, but I will, I will try. I wanna make sure you can actually get something out of this. Yes. Um, there's another note here on hydroponics. Uh, hydroponic growth systems should be set up to include a meshwork mat to support seeds or seedlings in early growth and support the stems and maintain the roots below the mat in the hydroponic solution later in growth. And hydroponics are a cool system because it gives you a lot of growing area per it gives you a lot of 
plant growth potential per unit surface area. Um, there are other problems with it, of course, because you have to keep adding things to make it, uh, to get it started. Uh, unlike here on Earth, where you kind of have a, a nice starting point and a, and a complex ecosystem already in place to support growth. You're not wrong, but also the program that I'm using to stream uh, is resizing it to counteract my zooming a little bit. So it's it's not one to one, unfortunately. But I appreciate the uh, I appreciate the effort to problem solve with me. All right. What design modifications would you need to make to support plants with different photo periods? For example, long day versus short day plants. Um, put another way, can I put my short day plants with my long day plants? If the different plant species you were growing had different photo periods, um, you'd need to grow them in separate chambers. You would want to isolate them. Um, you could then, yeah, if you put them in separate tables, then you can just set up different timer controls. So your your lighting works on a normal uh, rhythm appropriate for that plant. And that's everything I've got for you. We, we could even go a little bit further here and, and talk about not just your 24 hour period, but also your seasonal periods, right? Your, your year long periods. Um, if you're growing plants that well, the, if you're growing plants that have normal changes in productivity throughout a normal earth year life cycle, um, then you would want to emulate those conditions if you could. Plants that downregulate their production in response to those changes, though, may not actually be desirable because or, or plants that require that for their life cycle may not be desirable uh, because then you're not getting maximum yield out of what is a very finite resource uh, on your station. So something to consider. Um, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, my email is not going to be legible if I type it there. H-L-E-A at pdx.edu. Let me know if you have any questions. The recording for this will go up within the hour on the PSU Learning Center YouTube channel. Um, And remember to submit your worksheets uh, by end of day Friday to get your point of extra credit. Thank you to those of you attending live. Uh, if you're watching in the future, thanks for tuning in. I will see you all next week. Have a great weekend.